Welcome to the Finding Dad Bod, where my dad, Coach Alex Van Houten, plus his 14 years of experience to work for you. You should listen to him. Here's Pity Beast Mode. Who knows who we could be if we could become 1% better every single day. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing super well. You are listening to Season 3, Episode 46 of Defining Dad Bod, where we're talking about anxiety. This is an extremely important episode, given that in 2019, 19% of the adult population in the U.S. reported wrestling with anxiety. And in May 2021, that's one year after the breaking of the COVID pandemic, 31% of United States adults report wrestling with anxiety. I hope you'll listen close, and I hope you'll share this with a friend or loved one who needs to hear it. This episode's been brought to you by the Better Daily community. In our Better Daily app, we are all working hard to become 1% better every single day. And despite the obstacles that life throws at us, in the Better Daily app, we know we're not alone. Go to definingdadbod.com slash betterdaily and use the code DADBOD, D-A-D-B-O-D, by clicking the code tab in the upper right corner of the checkout screen to save 25% off your subscription. That's definingdadbod.com slash better daily. Use code D-A-D-B-O-D. Definingdadbod.com slash better daily. Upgrade your screen time today. Before we get to our show on anxiety and what we can do about it, I've got some food for thought for you. For those of you who don't know, we keep chickens in our backyard. I built a chicken coop last year. And we got some hens from a friend, and we've been enjoying backyard fresh eggs ever since. It's been a learning experience, and it's been a lot of fun. Turns out, my wife is a pretty good chicken mama, and the chore of letting the chickens out in the morning, feeding them, giving them treats, and helping me clean the coop is a wonderful set of chores for our five-year-old. I'm not going to lie, I'm in it for the eggs. I've been eating three a day since I was 18 years old, and there's just something about the deep orange yolks and the flavorful whites that 100% offsets the chicken poop on my back porch. Recently, one of our hens went broody, which is a chicken word that means... The instinct to become a mother took her by storm. She would spend 18 hours a day sitting in a nesting box, sometimes on eggs, sometimes on nothing, because something deep down was telling her, you need to be a mom soon. What's crazy is, she was doing it at the detriment of her health. Over a period of three weeks, she went from a healthy-sized chicken to basically skin and bones. And my wife, being the good chicken mother that she is, was really worried about her. So we did what any good chicken parents would do, and we got her some babies. Here in Arkansas, people hatch chickens all the time, and a lady down the road was willing to sell us a couple of hers. So we introduced the chicks in the middle of the night, and the next morning, she was momming it up. She started eating again. Everything was hunky-dory. So that's been an adventure. But there was a moment yesterday in the yard that really stood out to me. She and her chicks ventured out in the grass, and every few feet she would stop and scratch. And I noticed after watching her for a few minutes that every once in a while she would scratch and then make a weird clucking sound I'd never heard from her before. The chicks would stand at attention and run to her face, and then after pecking at whatever she clucked at, went back to normal. I went a little closer to investigate. thought it was weird. I knew chickens talked to each other, but I didn't know the babies could respond. And I also didn't know that it could be any more complicated than cluck, 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 cluck. While I was watching her, it turns out she was scratching the ground, and every time she popped an earthworm out of the ground, she made a very specific noise that I guess in chickens says, Hey, look, guys, an earthworm. And in the past, when chickens uncover an earthworm, they gulp it down. It's super crazy. One moment there's an earthworm there, and the next moment there's not. But instead of eating the earthworm, she was tossing it around at her chicks and showing them how to handle an earthworm until they figured it out. The whole earthworm endeavor would last one to two minutes, and then she'd go back to looking for more. Why am I telling you this? I was floored. Chickens have a peanut-sized brain, and while they're interesting and form their own personalities and social communities and lay really good eggs, they're chickens. They're not particularly brave or cunning or beautiful. Sometimes they're downright stupid and stinky. But this mother chicken was teaching her chicks how to dig for and eat earthworms, and she was doing it in a peaceful, methodic, and patient manner, and I was blown away. You see, I knew that this particular chicken didn't actually have a mom. She was raised via incubation and socialized with her fellow chicks. That is to say, nobody taught her how to dig up earthworms and eat them. But here she was, 
passing on what she'd learned to the next generation, and she was doing it with her peanut-sized brain, and with her children, whose brains couldn't be bigger than a bean. You could say that it was in her bones to take hard-earned lessons that nobody taught her and hand it off to the chicks who didn't know how well they had it. My food for thought for you today is this. What lessons have you had to learn the hard way? Nobody helped you figure them out. You did the difficult work, and now they're yours to benefit from. And my follow-up question is, who are you passing those lessons on to? You see, in the chicken world, not knowing how to dig up worms and eat them isn't a huge deal. You'll eventually see another chicken do it and go figure it out yourself. Learning it a little younger might result in better eggs younger, or maybe better health, and maybe because of the better eggs and better health, an opportunity not to get pecked so much by the other hens. But in the human world, our lessons are a lot more complicated and a lot more consequential, and we accumulate the hard-earned lessons of our ancestors over time that benefit us, and if we can meaningfully pass them on to our kids and our communities, they benefit future generations as well. Keep learning and growing, and keep passing that stuff on. It matters. That's your food for thought today. I hope it gives you something to munch on. Now, without further ado, let's talk about the science of anxiety, and how we as individuals have powerful tools at our disposal to improve our lives. When I was nine years old, I climbed my first climbing wall. I was really excited. I put the harness on. Everybody cheered me on as I grabbed each handhold. And as I scaled the wall, all I felt was determination and focus. But when I got over the wall and I stood on top of the small platform where a man in a safety harness was strapped in and began helping me to take off my rope and transition to the rappel tower, suddenly that excitement and that focus turned to dread. I was 30 feet high but it might as well have been a thousand feet to me. I got weak in the knees, my heart started beating really fast, and I could barely speak. It was like I resembled nothing like the boy who was climbing the wall prior. I'd been turned from a brave, determined, rational-thinking human being into a scared, frightened, and even panicked person. With a bit of coaxing and coaching, and direct eye contact, the man at the top of the tower was able to instruct me how to start my rappel, and I remember as I was lowering myself on the rope, the closer I got to the ground, the more I trusted the rope not to drop me, my heart rate came down, my breathing became normal again, and that intense fear subsided. That's called acrophobia, the fear of heights. And when I was nine years old, climbing up the climbing wall, I didn't know any better. I didn't know that it's a natural and innate human response to be scared out of your mind when you realize you're exposed, and if you fell from this height, you'd probably die, or at least be very injured. Now today we're talking about anxiety, and what I just described to you is the physiological feeling that accompanies a myriad of diagnoses that are all lumped under the umbrella of anxiety. The umbrella of anxiety is a big one, affecting 19% of the population of the United States. That's almost 50 million people, and that was pre-COVID. A recent article put out by the American Psychological Association estimates that nearly 30% of adults have experienced anxiety in the last year, and the effects of the growth of anxiety in the population are likely not done yet. Under this umbrella of anxiety are a number of different disorders. The most common one is generalized anxiety disorder, which takes the fear response that I just described to you about being on the top of that climbing wall and generalizes it to many different things in life, including relationships, the future, finances, and many other things, such that those individuals who wrestle with generalized anxiety disorder are in a constant state of the fear response. Then there are the phobias. That is, the fear of very specific things that can create an irrational panic response. These phobias include things like acrophobia, which I just described to you, the fear of heights, or the other two A's, agoraphobia, that's the fear of public places, and arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. I wouldn't call my mother an anxious individual, but you've never quite seen somebody move so fast as when my mom encounters an unexpected spider. I'm sure part of my hero complex as an adult has something to do with rescuing my mom from the countless spiders of my childhood. Hashtag true story. And then also under the umbrella of anxiety disorders is panic disorder, where an individual goes into a state of panic that is so intense that the physiological response feels very similar to a heart attack, which is where many of these individuals are diagnosed with panic disorder. After a trip to the emergency room that confirms, no, no heart attack, this was a panic attack. Now what do things like generalized anxiety disorder 
panic disorder, and arachnophobia all have in common. At their core, the anxiety disorders are an overwhelming fear response that often leads to feelings of being trapped in dread. But as we'll see when we talk about these today, if you're somebody who doesn't wrestle with anxiety, you might say, what's the big deal? It's just a spider. It's just a snake. It's just life. Get over it. Stop worrying so much. And if you're somebody who does wrestle with anxiety, you've heard those things more often than you can count, and you likely tell yourself those things every single day, which makes the anxiety worse. That's called rumination, by the way. The mulling over conversations or situations or thoughts in your mind over and over and over again and being unable to shut them off. And that's a hallmark trait of many of the anxiety disorders. Current standardized treatments for anxiety include prescription medications. Antidepressants have been shown to have a positive effect on those with generalized anxiety disorder, as have anti-anxiety medications, and even beta blockers, whose primary purpose is actually to affect the heart and blood pressure, but it turns out a positive side effect is to reduce anxiety. The only problem is that many who are under prescription medication for anxiety report that the side effects are even worse than living with the dread. And while some of these medications make certain situations more manageable, most patients often question the viability of these as long-term treatment options. The other way anxiety is treated is with cognitive behavioral therapy. That is, facing those fears in small incremental steps that eventually teach the brain that it's made of sterner stuff than you know, and dampening the fear response when encountering those things that cause anxiety. For instance, somebody who wants to get over their fear of heights might be exposed to pictures of heights, and then physically going to a climbing wall, and then over a series of weeks, climbing higher and higher, until one is able to stand on top of the climbing wall, face it, calm themselves, and teach their brain that while heights are scary, there's no need to be panicked when approaching things consciously, intelligently, and safely. The problem with cognitive behavioral therapy is it's difficult to treat generalized anxiety disorder, where individuals feel trapped by dread, not because of things they're currently facing, but because of situations, thoughts, or feelings conjured in the waking and sleeping hours of the day. It's very difficult to, quote, face your fears, when right now your brain is telling you that everything is on the brink of ending in disaster. It's for this reason that the 19% of the population that wrestles with anxiety is very often diagnosed with depression. It is exhausting to the mind and the body to be on high alert all the time. And so after being anxious for a time, many people will deplete their body's reserves and end up in a state of depression. Add to that the feeling that you can't escape from something that's in your own mind, and you have all the more reason to be more depressed. Thanks for the gloom and doom, Alex. This is officially the worst podcast episode you've ever recorded. I can hear you thinking, but hang with me. There's light at the end of the tunnel, and we're going to get there together. But as we'll see today, anxiety is not so much an over-rampant fear response as it is a dysfunction in the ability to learn not to be afraid. It turns out this is a very important distinction, and if you don't take anything else away from me today, hear this. If you are wrestling with anxiety, and you feel trapped in a space of dread and fear, it's not like John F. Kennedy said, that the only thing to fear is fear itself, but more so we should fear the inability to learn not to be afraid. That'll make more sense in a second, so hang with me. So first we're going to talk about what anxiety actually is, what's happening in the brain, and why that happens to some people rather than others. Then, after digging into some of the cognitive nitty-gritty, we're going to talk about exercise's effects on anxiety, and how, at the level of the brain, certain types of exercise actually equip the brain to learn not to be afraid, both in the immediate and for the long term. Then we'll talk about how to use exercise in order to start or enhance your current anxiety treatment for yourself. And then we'll end the show with a few other things that aren't exercise related that have been shown to have a powerful effect on anxiety. First, let's talk about what's going on in the brain of somebody who is actively experiencing anxiety. In order to understand this well, you need to know a structure in the brain called the amygdala. Say amygdala with me. Amygdala. The amygdala is a super tiny portion of the brain around the size of a ping pong ball. And its job is to take in all the sensory information that's coming in through your eyes, through your hands, even in your own mind, and tag potentially fearful events. By tagging, I mean it red flags them. It tells you they're worth attending to. Imagine you're about to walk across a street in a busy city. You wait for the stoplight to turn red and for the little walking dude to light up to tell you to cross the street safely. You begin to step into the street, 
but you hear a sound, kind of like a car coming at you, and out of the corner of your eye, you see a white flash. Immediately, you turn to look, and then jump back onto the curve, because some idiot wasn't watching the red light and almost ran your butt over. In that moment, you owe your life to your amygdala. The sound you heard, the white flash you saw, the amygdala tagged that and told the rest of the brain, hey, this is worth attending to so we don't die. You step back onto the curve and live to fight another day. Thanks, amygdala. In individuals who are experiencing anxiety, this amygdalic tag is out of control. The tag happens, and instead of the brain taking time to say, is this worth being afraid of, yes or no, it keeps tagging the fearful thing louder and louder. In an individual who experiences anxiety, instead of stepping back onto the curve, living to fight another day, and maybe shaking their fist at the driver, the amygdala then tags the entire intersection as a scary place where you probably could die. And the rest of the brain, for reasons we'll talk about later, is unable to speak sense to the red flags. The thing about fear is, survival memories override all other memories. And so in a way, fear is forever in the brain. I experienced this recently, when my wife came running into the house and said, Hey, come kill this snake. I came outside, and under a rose bush was a king snake, all coiled up, about three feet long. King snakes are non-poisonous. They're actually really helpful for keeping the rodent population low and killing and eating poisonous snakes. My wife wasn't having it. She didn't want that snake around. I told her I wasn't going to kill it, but that I'd get it out of the bushes. So I flung it into the front yard. No more snake in the bushes. Three weeks later, she still can't walk by that rose bush. She walks up our sidewalk and then gives that rose bush a good six foot wide berth just in case there's a snake coiled up under it. And this is the way of fear-based memories across all human beings. When it comes to survival, our intensely negative fear-based memories are more enduring than our positive memories. That's very adaptive, because if you think about it, you can be pretty joyful, but you can also be pretty dead too. And so it's more important for you as an organism to avoid being dead than it is for you to go do joyful things. At least that's true from a biological perspective. But what is it? that takes that adaptive fear response to things like snakes, spiders, and heights, and in some people, generalizes that fear to the world in such a way that they're on high alert all the time, anxious, high-strung, upset, sleepless, and exhausted. That's a very good question, and it boils down to a number of risk factors. One, this sort of generalized anxiety runs in families. There seems to be a genetic predisposition toward feeling fear and that amygdalic response running rampant. If you have a mom or dad, sibling or cousin who wrestles with anxiety, it's very likely that you have some of those predispositions as well. The second is past abuse or trauma. It turns out that if you've experienced something intensely fearful, like in my case, witnessing the abuse of my mother by my father and having to call the cops on him when I was four, those intensely traumatic experiences in developmental childhood can also predispose a person to experience anxiety later in life. There are other situational risk factors as well. Poverty, and in females especially, divorce, can also be risk factors for anxiety. Now remember I told you that the amygdalic response, the red flagging, the tagging of fearful events, can be countered in the brain by different parts of the brain that tell the amygdala, hey, that's not a big deal. And it turns out that these risk factors might actually affect that process. And what's positive and powerful about this is if you understand what these risk factors do to the brain, and then you understand how exercise affects the brain, then you'll see why well-informed psychiatrists have been recommending specific types of exercise for anxiety over the last 30 years. And the fact that exercise works on these systems and helps those with anxiety is further proof that anxiety is not so much an overwhelming fear response or a trap of dread that you can't get out of, but more so the failure of your brain to learn how not to be afraid. And that failure, it turns out, is something that can be overcome. In studies of exercise, specifically moderate to high-intensity cardiovascular exercise, the brain's miracle grow, BDNF, brain-derived neutrophic factor, increases significantly. Brain-derived neutrophic factor can increase the growth of the structures of the brain that can shut down the amygdala. Similarly, moderate to high-intensity cardiovascular exercise releases triglycerides in the bloodstream that then increase the amount of the amino acid tryptophan in the bloodstream. When tryptophan crosses the blood-brain barrier, it's used to synthesize GABA, that is gamma-aminobutyric acid, and the neurotransmitter serotonin. Both GABA 
and serotonin are the neurotransmitters that seem to be positively affected by prescriptions that are used to treat anxiety. Similarly, moderate to high-intensity exercise causes the heart to release a peptide called ANP, that's atrial nutriuretic peptide, and what AMP does is tell the brain that it's time to relax because the heart's been working pretty hard. Altogether, this flood of BDNF, GABA, serotonin, and AMP make exercise a very powerful anti-anxiety medication all by itself. Add to that the fact that those who wrestle with anxiety actually have higher innate muscle tension in their bodies, which can be relaxed today by exercise, and that in the act of exercising, specifically repetitive movements like walking, jogging, or running, activate the basal nucleus, which effectively shuts down the brain's amygdala response, then exercise becomes a powerful treatment for anxiety in the immediate. I feel like we've covered a lot, so let's do a quick recap. Anxiety is not so much over-rampant fear that you can't escape from, as it is an inability for your brain to learn not to listen to the amygdala so much. Those of us who have been through abuse, trauma, genetic predispositions, poverty, and even intense relational strife are predisposed to have intense fear responses and to lack the brain power to be able to combat them. While medical treatments do exist, both in terms of prescription and cognitive behavioral therapy, many report these to be insufficient for one reason or another. And so understanding that the immediate effect of exercise is to increase all of the brain power required to combat anxiety and to shut down those circuits altogether in the immediate, exercise becomes a viable enhancement to combat anxiety, improve quality of life, and improve long-term outcomes. So if you're listening to the sound of my voice and you wrestle with anxiety, how can you use exercise to optimally combat that issue? Here are four rules. First, strive to start your day with exercise. Just 20 minutes of moderate to high-intensity cardiovascular exercise will vastly improve your anxiety response all day long. From a training perspective, I know that the body can only handle so much moderate to high-intensity cardiovascular exercise without injury. Start your day at least four days a week with 20 minutes of moderate to high-intensity cardiovascular exercise. This will ensure that the benefits of the increased BDNF, GABA, AMP, reduced muscle tension, and basal nucleus activation all follow you throughout your day. And the other three days a week, start your day with a walk. Make it brisk and purposeful. And even if you don't get all of the effects of moderate to high-intensity cardio, you will reduce muscle tension and you will activate the basal nucleus so that you're less likely to have an activated amygdala, that is, that fear flagger, in your day-to-day. -day. If you're already engaged in an exercise program, but you're still experiencing anxiety, you can keep your current program, just add to it a 20-minute walk or jog in the mornings, and work with your coach or trainer to offset any volume issues to prevent injuries in the future. The second rule of exercise, you can use it just like folks use anti-anxiety medications, and exercise can be used in the same way, either proactively, which is knowing that you're going to go through something anxiety-producing, and so you exercise intensely prior to take the edge off and to approach that anxiety-producing situation in a calm way, or following an anxiety-producing event, you can take a 10 to 15 minute exercise break and come back to your day feeling refreshed and renewed. Remember, anxiety is a result of both the flagging of fearful events by the amygdala and the rest of the brain's inability to stop that fear response in its tracks. Going for a 10 to 15 minute brisk walk redirects the brain's energy to activate the basal nucleus, which is responsible for motor function, and therefore unplugs the amygdala so it stops producing fear responses. The third rule of exercise, if you're wrestling with anxiety, is that weight training can be used to maintain good posture and to prevent injuries, since someone who's wrestling with anxiety requires a lot of repetitive movements in their exercise. The science is clear. Adding 60 minutes of moderate to high-intensity cardiovascular exercise in somebody's week does amazing things for those who are wrestling with anxiety. But what happens if the way you're running hurts your lower back? Well, then you're left with your original problem, and you've removed one of your tools to combat it with. If you're wrestling with anxiety, it's important that the person who's creating your program knows that keeping your coping mechanisms around is an extremely important part of your program. And if that person programming is you, then your priority is to lift weights in such a way that stretches out overactive muscles and activates underactive muscles to keep your body in great balance so you can continue moving forward. 
The number four thing is don't do this alone. If you're wrestling with anxiety and now you know exercise can help you combat it, don't use that as an excuse not to tell somebody about it. The effects of anxiety are no joke, especially since they can lead to depression and the feelings of dread and being trapped in that dread while also being depressed is a powerful force for personal disaster. Please tell a loved one if you're experiencing intense anxiety and commit to a partnership with a professional who can help, even if it's just to say out loud, I've been wrestling with anxiety. I'm in constant fear of the things that could go wrong around me. I'm pretty sure it's all going to end in disaster, and I'm depressed and guilty from feeling this way all the time. Saying that out loud to somebody who can help is like having somebody at the top of the climbing wall with you who can look you in the eyes and say, I'm sorry you've been feeling this way. There's nothing wrong with you as a human being, and there's hope for a better tomorrow if we can face it together. Exercise is a powerful tool and has been clinically shown to improve the symptoms of anxiety, but nothing will bolster you like another human you can trust. Don't do this thing alone. And while I was diving into the research to prepare for this show, I did find three other things that, from a scientific perspective, have been shown to improve the symptoms of anxiety. The first one is music. It turns out that listening to certain types of music, and that varied between individuals, can actually switch on certain circuits of the brain that combat anxiety and switch off the ones that are creating it. If you wrestle with anxiety, chances are you know the music that tends to make you feel better. And for you, it's just a matter of being conscious of the times when you're mostly anxious and ensuring that that sort of music is playing in your ears or in the background. I've also found that if music's not available, simply resolving to sing the songs or hum them can have a positive effect on the anxiety response. The second well-studied intervention is journaling. Remember I talked about rumination as being a hallmark symptom of anxiety. If you're wrestling with that constant conversation in your head, writing those things down can actually get them out of your system. And while there's a lot of hype about gratitude journaling, which is actually a powerful intervention that I've mentioned on the show for a number of reasons, when it comes to anxiety, gratitude journaling doesn't seem to have much of a positive or beneficial effect. As a coach, I have mistakenly recommended gratitude journaling to those who I didn't know was wrestling with anxiety, when instead, what the research shows is that if you're wrestling with anxiety, it's better to write down that stuff that you probably wouldn't say to anybody. The fears, the to-do lists, the pain, and even the anger and guilt. Writing those things down has been shown to reduce anxiety symptoms, and while gratitude journal is wonderful and positive, or may even be something that you share with friends, family, or your social media, an anxiety journal is not so pretty, but it can be helpful in the long run. The last thing I found in researching this topic that was interesting was the effect on certain essential oils on anxiety. Kind of like music, diffusing essential oils can actually create an atmosphere that changes the way your brain is functioning. Bergamot, vetiver, and lavender were on the list of oils that had potentially calming effects. Our olfactory system, the part of us that allows us to smell things, is our closest perceptual system to our amygdala. And so the inhalation of different scents that are calming to us can have a positive impact on the amygdala's tendency to tag and red flag certain things. And if you're wrestling with anxiety, it's worth a shot. And so there you have it. This is what we know about how exercise affects anxiety. If you're wrestling with an out-of-control fear response that's creating dread and strife in your life, and maybe even driving you into depression and solitude, I hope this information's been helpful to you. And I hope you'll act on it. Start your day with exercise. Use exercise as a dose of anti-anxiety. Weight train to prevent injury. And don't do this thing alone. If you know somebody who needs to hear this information, please share it with them. And if you're wrestling with anxiety, and this has been helpful to you, or it's raised some questions, shoot me a message at coachal at definingdadbot.com. I'm not a licensed therapist, but I'm happy to be an ear, help you with your exercise programming, and point you in the direction of some support. No matter what you're facing, you're made of sterner stuff than you know, and our job is to get our mind, body, and spirit on board with that truth. This has been Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. Until next time, guys, kick butt, take names. The free, practical advice and conversations here remain unbought and unbiased thanks to the support of Better Daily. If this episode has been helpful to you, share it with someone in your life who you know it will benefit. Then subscribe to the podcast and leave us a raving review to tell others what value Defining Dad Bond has brought to your health and fitness journey. Finally, 
If you're struggling for betterment, don't do it alone. We all have a cross to carry, and it's lighter when we do it together. Go to definingdadbod.com slash better daily to get supported, challenged, and inspired to take yourself to the next level. Who knows who we could be if we could become 1% better every single day. Go to definingdadbod.com slash better daily today. That's definingdadbod.com slash better daily.